Hello, I'm Rob Gordon. In my work as a psychologist, I've spoken to a lot of people after their experience of disasters, big and small, during the last 20 years. And I'm here to talk to you a bit about preparing mentally to encounter a bushfire. What I'd like to start with is actually before the fires and the assumptions and expectations that we build up in our normal lives. We don't realise how important they are in organising how we think, how we act, how we prepare. The fact, for example, that we can see a fair distance around and that uh, the sounds and uh, temperature and other things like that are, are as they have been. Now, uh, what, what we have to be prepared for is that all of that's going to go out of the window in any kind of very severe natural disaster. Bloody hell. Just everywhere's burning. I think the shed's stuffed. It's scary. I'm amazed the power's still on. Shit. Um, it's like being in a really thick fog. I mean, you can't get your bearings off anything. You know, you, your normal way of, like, a hill's over there, so you know that means you've got to go. Well, there's none of that. I mean, or you, you can't. And, and for one split second, I was lost, and then... Luckily, Michael had put the light, the warning light, on top of the um, the grader which we had on the property, mm. and luckily that, yeah, that was the guided beacon. me back. That was the beacon. Yeah. We used that for the rest of the night. Then many people are thrown and disoriented and confused by the intensity and unusualness of the sensations, and so I think one of the things that people need to stop and think about, and I would say even imagine is what it's likely to be like in their little environment when there's a howling hot wind, uh, they can hardly see more than a metre in front of them because of smoke, and the environment is full of flying debris and noise. Um, and, and then think about how they're going to go out and block the gutters and uh, start their pump and so on. Probably I, I thought I knew what, it was, what, what, what was going to happen, but uh, just the, the intensity and the force um, and, and the speed that, that, that it happened was just um, really caught me unawares. And the place went totally dark, um, dark enough that a, a torch couldn't penetrate the darkness. Um, you're, you couldn't see the fence post, just to see behind us. Um, uh, and you had no idea then what was happening. You couldn't see neighbours, there was no, no way knowing what, what else was happening outside. Yeah, I've never seen it get so 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 black like that before. Um, this is four o'clock in the afternoon of a you know really hot sunny sunny day. And next thing it's pitch black, so it's a quite a, quite an eerie feeling. Um, yeah, something you, know, you have to sort of be you know, think about and think your way through. What we have to understand here is the state that we go into, which we could call it uh, an emergency mode. Mm. And uh, that's a, a set of mechanisms that we've got deep inside our brains prepared through evolution. Now that that's, uh, involves adrenaline going on and a whole lot of changes, uh, tremendous amounts of energy, tremendous amounts of focus, courage, ability to keep going for however long it takes, etc. And everybody's got that in one way or another. And what we need people to understand is that the advantage that that gives us to survive is based on the fact that we shift our normal uh, way of functioning from thinking in words and big picture sort of stuff into very narrow visual thinking. I was so busy I didn't get a chance to really think about too much except what my job was. And um, my job was to look after a particular area of our home and, um, and to make sure that the fire couldn't get to it. And I can remember at one stage, my, I was at the back of the home and I could see my daughter through the blackness and uh, I could see flames all right over the roof here. And I thought, I think we might lose the house. And I thought, I can only see Emma. I can't see any of the rest of the family. And there was not a thing I could do. I could, not, I could not leave where I was to see whether anybody was all right because 
I could be putting my own life in danger. I could be putting their life in danger. I could be letting the fire come to the house at that stage. So, um, yeah, it was, um, I survived it. This is why, in order to be able to perform complicated actions, we must rehearse them. So, of course, the firefighters actually don't just sit in their office and read books. They get out and do it again and again and again, so that when they go into that adrenaline mode, they're accessing a whole set of routines that they've actually got there as memories in their visual system. And that's what uh, the rest of us have to do. So we think, well, I'll remember this, that and the other, and it's, I know where the pump is, etc. But when you go into this adrenaline state, you're going to have a lot of trouble actually thinking that through. But if you've done it and routinized it and made it almost habitual, you're going to do it without thinking. You're just going to go straight to the cupboard, put on your stuff, and out, out you go. Even though we live in a bushfire area, fire plans weren't a huge priority. Let me tell you, that's now changed. <laughs> that's very different now. Make a fire plan for a start. You really need to be, have decided before the fire gets to you what you're going to do. Because afterwards, everything's in the spur of the moment, and it's, will I, won't I? Don't panic. And if you think you're likely to panic, don't stay. Just make sure you're well out of the way before it happens. Mm. It'd be very, very easy to panic mm. when, when you see, see that happening and the sound and, and the whole experience. I mean, you can imagine it, but imagination and reality are two different things. Mm. You know, you, you really, really got to be fairly certain um, what your plan is. I can't say how people are going to react in a fire. Everybody reacts differently. I know how I react in an emergency. I've been involved with the CFA for 25 years, been in a lot of emergencies. Um, but I do have to stress that if you don't think you can handle the situation, make that decision early and leave. We often use the word panic loosely when we're talking about uh, dealing with very dramatic events. And we need to understand that the experience of being high on adrenaline and in high emergency mode and maybe having a lot of very intense feelings and maybe even doing some things that surprise us is not the same as panic. Panic is when we are so frightened and disturbed that we lose our ability to be rational and we just engage in very simple attempts to save our own life, often at the expense of others. Examples of panicking in a bushfire would be people who jump out of their car because it's just too hot to cope with, even though opening the car door means death. So we need to understand that if we are in a state of, of high emotion, in adrenaline mode, in emergency mode, that's not panic. And the reason it's not panic is because we are making decisions and undertaking plans, even if in an emotional state, to do our best to help ourselves and others. What we must do is ensure that in this highly emotional state people hold on to knowledge and plans and then their actions will be productive and make the best uh, of their situation. What adrenaline, the adrenaline system does is it, it shuts down the internal feedback systems. Mm -hmm. So it, we don't feel fatigue and we often don't feel pain. You, you even think in a football match you can crack your shin and have this great big bruise but you only feel it in the shower after the yes, game yeah. because the adrenaline just shuts it down. Now that means if you use your normal habitual uh, way of going about things which is, I drink when I'm thirsty, I eat when I'm hungry, I rest when I'm tired, then if you, if you use that, you're not going to start feeling hungry, thirsty and tired until you're seriously dehydrated, your blood sugar is very depleted and you're about to fall over, and your exhaustion is such that you're about to be unable to perform uh, vital tasks. And when we go to that state, when we do drink, eat and rest, it doesn't work right. 
the water's not absorbed because the tissues aren't right. You know, we can't digest the food easily. So what we've got to do is actually factor those three issues into our routine. So we've got to have water and food pre pre-positioned, mm. and we've got to, uh, you know, train ourselves to be taking it regularly, regardless of how we feel. And we've got to base that, you know, we need to take a drink every half hour or something. The adrenaline system makes us incredibly focused on those specific things that we have to deal with in order to survive. And we move from one to another quickly and we don't kind of process it afterwards. So when we come out of it, uh, mentally, we, we're full of a whole series of very intense fragments of experiences like little flashbulb memories, we call them in psychology, with very vivid memories that aren't just memories of, I remember this, but I feel as though it's happening again, it's there. You know, I can smell the smoke, I can feel the heat on my skin, I can feel the surge of concern as I wondered where my dog was or whatever it might be. And what we need to do is to actually uh, engage the other parts of the brain, the language parts. And if you, what people will find is if they simply describe in words to somebody else the very intense images, they'll start to subside. I was home with my mother-in-law and her partner and 40 acres to look after. Graham finally returned my calls. He tried to assure me that all would be okay. This unnerved me. I asked him what planet he was on, maybe not in those exact words. He looked in my direction. His words unprintable. The fire explodes through the trees at us. The hens and roosters start to die from the smoke before the fire engulfs their house. Things aren't looking good. The fire front is at us. It was on. They might need to do it a few times in different ways with different people because we, we cover a different aspect with every different relationship we have. Yes. But if we simply describe and describe those things that are most intense, try to find the words. And in doing so, we start to, I, I use the term, we, we digest our experience, just like we digest our dinner. And that means uh, we also, in a family, all share what we went through, because no two people have the same experience. And sitting down and talking with the Salvation Army people and having them talk to us, I think it, it was at that point when it really came home that we had, hadn't got a thing to our name really anymore. And their support and their, their counselling and the little discussions we had there was, was excellent. I mean, it made a big difference. Because mm, mm. uh, the emotions all just came straight to the top and those people know professionally what to do and it was excellent. We set it up in such a way that the residents could come in and, uh, and just relax and it was, became a meeting place for the residents uh, because they had nowhere else to meet so uh, nine times out of ten they weren't coming looking for things, they were coming just to meet on a social basis just to talk things out. I want to emphasise a few important things that come out of talking over what happened with people around you. First thing I want to emphasise is that what switches on the adrenaline and the emergency mode in our brains is not what actually happens, it's what we think is going to happen. Because it switches on before it happens, even if it's only a split second. It wouldn't be much good, for example, if our adrenaline system only switched on when something happened. Because that would mean as a car was about to hit us, it wouldn't switch on. But in fact it switches on when we think something's going to happen. Now that means we go into that emergency mode even if nothing happens. So it's very important that even if people think they're going to be in high danger or might be hurt or killed, 
that they recognise that they have had an impact. There's no such thing as a psychological near miss. If you thought something terrible was going to happen to you, then you've gone into that emergency mode and the best way to come out of it is to go through why did you think that, what did you think, how did you get ready, what did you think was going to happen and what did actually happen and make sure you connect what did happen with what you thought was going to happen so that you can come out of that state. One of the things that keeps people feeling agitated and upset a long time after the event is not what actually happened but keeping on going back to what they imagined would happen and going back to the what ifs and then worrying about how it might have turned out. There is a tendency for us to break up the uh, clear story of the, of the experience and what actually happened into a series of fragments and those fragments will often feed our imagination and people often find that the day after they spend more time imagining what might have happened if things had gone, gone wrong than actually uh, coming to grips with what did happen. And so it's very important to, so to speak, bind the whole story together in your mind by telling it as a story. Once you've told the story and closed those gaps and linked things up, they tend to sit in our minds in a much more stable way instead of breaking open and allowing room for all these unnecessary emotions to start circulating again. Now what we know is that you can actually get the process of recovery going and I would say every family that's been through this make it a, a, just a part of your plan that as soon as everything's safe and as soon as every, everyone's had a bit of a drink and settled down then sit together and talk to each other about what you all experience. Make a family story about it. And, uh, and this will help everyone understand each other and you'll find as you talk the emotions will come up, they'll go through, they'll be expressed and they'll naturally just settle down. But if we don't do that, they'll sort of flip in and out and uh, not go anywhere. You know, communities like to get together and then there are, you know, celebrations and, and, and memorials and various things. All of these things of joining in some process, of sharing the experience in various ways, are very important. But I uh, want to get together and stand around for a glass of wine and just uh, chew the fat over what happened on the day and, and um, be able to express it and know what other people went through as well. I suppose just getting together with other people to exchange experiences, uh, exchange emotions and all of that, that was good. That was good. The other thing I would say is be aware that the, if you've been in adrenaline mode, you've depleted your reserves and People need to rebuild their reserves. It's just good to, good to do stuff and just get away from everything up in the hills. Rethink the next couple of months and mm -hmm. what you've got planned. You know, if you're going to renovate the bathroom during this time, don't do it if you've been through a bushfire. Just take it easy because that's the best way of recovering. Uh, just a bit of more leisure, a bit more recreation, just allowing yourself to, to get back on top of it. I would assume a bad experience like a, a very intense natural disaster, even if people don't lose things, they should uh, allow themselves a couple of months, uh, you know, make life as easy as possible in order to get through it. Otherwise, they tend to feel very stressed and very depleted six, 12 months down the track, and that's often people's health starts to suffer.